So we are on the fourth of eight Beatitudes this morning, and we have talked about blessed are those who are poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, and today we talk about blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, this is maybe an old expression, so, so maybe it's not something that we say a lot, but, but I remember hearing this a, a whole lot, and, and again, blessed are those hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. But here's the expression, and, and here's my character. The expression is this, you are what you eat. Who's heard of that expression, you are what you eat? Okay, so that makes this guy one big chocolate chip cookie. Who is this guy? Cookie Monster. Do you know there's a story about Cookie Monster now that, that because there was concern that he was only eating cookies, that they introduced vegetables into his diet. Enough that he discovered he liked carrots. But he will not be called Veggie Monster. He is still Cookie Monster. And I don't care what the letter C is good for. Come on, say it with me. C is for cookie. That's good enough for me. Cookie, cookie, cookie starts with C. That earworm will be with you the rest of the day, long after you've forgotten my sermon. You are what you eat. Now, the idea behind that was... And, and again, Cookie Monster is kind of a hint on that, is, is that if you eat too much junk, you know, your body pays the price. If you eat too much of anything that's not good for you, your body pays the price. And, and we have seen, you know, in the, the last several decades in this country, a, a change in much more processed and much less natural food, and we've had many, many more health difficulties that have gone along with all that processing. You are what you eat. But this beatitude is not so much about what we are eating. It's about what we're hungry for. Blessed are those, it doesn't say who eat righteousness. It's for those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, I think that there is something really interesting about what Jesus said here, because I think what you do is, if you take the beatitude and you take out a couple of words, you can still make it say something, but it says something completely different than Jesus was trying to get across. Could you move to the next one, slide, please? Um, yeah, you are what you're hungry for. We become what we're hungry for. So my question for you, beginning and end, is going to be this. Bottom line, what are you hungry for? Could you move to the next one, please? Because a lot of the things that we want don't end up satisfying. Here's, here's what you do. is Those who are hungry for fill in the blank will still be filled. So if you're hungry for success, you will be filled. Because you're going to... That appetite for success is going to drive the things that you do. If you're hungry for recognition, if you're hungry for acceptance, if you're hungry for, you know, avoiding missing out, and, and you know, I, I get how that's changed in the last generation where, you know, my, it's not my grandkids' generation who are not conversing with people, but their normal posture is this. Now, I don't say that as a bad thing. I just say that that's, that's their way of connecting, but there's also a real fear that if a text comes in, they better not miss it. Could that be something that has become your hunger and thirst? Basically, your fear of missing out. For some, it's, you know, I want to experience things. For some, it's, it's wealth. For some, it's power. For some, it's achievements. For some, it's grades. For, for some, it's happy relationships. For some, it's safety. If you're hungry for any of those things, you're going to set your diet, you're going to set your life, you're going to set your priorities, you're going to set your table with those things that fill that hunger, and you will be filled. 
So it's almost like if you take the words and shift them just a little bit from Jesus, you end up with a proverb that's true of just about anything. The difficulty is, is that every single one of those things that I just listed, success, recognition, acceptance, missing out, experience, wealth, power, achievement, grades, happy relationships, safety, they never fill you. And they never last. They are fundamentally empty calories. So that you have a momentary sense of being filled, but the moment that moment is done, you're hungry again. Cookie Monster eating cookies. You know, he's, he's done with a box of cookies, and it's like, me hungry. Hum, 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 hum. You know, back all over again. These things don't fill us. Look at just one aspect of this. If we are really hungry for recognition, and at one moment in time we get recognition from somebody, somebody just really gives us a compliment, and we just, you know, we really feel good for how long? Because then there's silence again. And then we need another hit of recognition. C.S. Lewis, the author, I think put this really well. I find in myself a desire, a hunger, if you will, which no experience, and let's broaden it, no missing out, no acceptance, no recognition, no wealth, no power, no achievement, no grades, no relationships, no safety, that none, that, that no, none of those things in this world can ultimately satisfy. And the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. St. Augustine put it this way, there is a hole in our hearts that can only be filled with God. So what are you hungry for? And by the way, if, if you think that I'm just kind of doing some nice psychologizing here, there's actually an entire book of the Bible in the Old Testament that was dedicated to a person who went from one thing to another, from, from pleasure to experience to wealth to power to absolutely everything to see if, if those things would provide meaning and provide depth and provide something for his life so that at the end of it he would have a sense of satisfaction and a sense of being filled. And if you know, all know the gist of the book of Ecclesiastes, there's not a book we mention very often, but there is a word that, that resounds after every one of those, those experiments that he ran, and that is meaningless. It didn't last. It didn't fill me. So Jesus says something that sets those things and, and acknowledges that we need those things that, that we need to be filled by something. And he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We'll unpack that word in a minute. In fact, we'll just kind of unpack each of those. Who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I want to go back to the very beginning of this series, and some of you may have been here for this, in which we kind of introduced three people. Um, Thaddeus and Rebecca, the young couple that just was kind of on the low end of the totem pole in Jewish society, and, and were really struggling to, to find any even just religious significance. And then Simon, the teacher, who, who knew very well that he was righteous enough, and, and he had accomplished everything that the laws and the rules required of him. And... Thaddeus and Rebecca were hungry for things to be set right. But what's noticeable about hunger and thirst is that you're not always the one providing the feeding. You're not always providing the food. You know, there's a number of us who, when, when it's breakfast time or it's lunch time or it's supper time, that when you sit down, someone else has made the food for you. Someone else has bought the food. Someone else went to the grocery store and picked up what was needed. And you get to sit down and you get to eat and you get to, to, to get full on what's for dinner or what's for lunch or what's for breakfast. And, and you get to walk away and sometimes even someone cleans it up for you. What a deal. 
hungering and thirsting is usually filled by somebody else. Thaddeus and Rebecca, our young couple, they just never seemed to get enough. They were always seemingly hungry. And Simon, the, the Pharisee, the teacher, he wasn't hungry anymore because, you know, he'd arrived. He knew he was righteous. You know, when you're good enough and you've done it all on your own and you've accomplished what you've needed to on your own, there's no hunger left. This beatitude speaks to any of us who know something's missing. That's what hunger and thirst is. Righteousness, that's a word that for them meant being so in, in, in line with what God wanted that not only personal behavior but family behavior and social behavior all reflected what God wanted. And there was a deep sense of fairness. There was a deep sense of justice. There was a deep sense of, of you know, again, I'm, I'm quoting C.S. Lewis here, but all of us have a, 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 an uncanny sense of what's fair. The moment someone jumps in line in front of us, we feel unfair. The moment someone treats us badly, we feel that we've been treated unfairly. And something needs to be done about that unfairness, about that unjustness, and that desire is righteous. There is a sense that this world in every one of its systems does not line up with God's will. And so there is this wonderful sense of hunger where we say, man, God, I want this to be the way you want it. And I just don't see it, but I'm, I'm hungry for that. And that's, that's the hint that righteousness gives us, that there's this sense that, that when things finally line up with God's will, that's when righteousness gets to be visible. And that's when we really, really see it in, in our own lives around us. And we are hungry for God to come in and fix this mess. Because, again, I'm speaking from my experience here, but, but I've even been at this ministry business long enough to realize that, that the more we're doing things and the busier we are, that there's a long list of things that we are literally powerless to do anything about. the amount of things that I'm not able to set straight is way bigger than the list of things that I can actually do. Thank you for not saying amen at that particular moment. The moment I know that I can't fix everything and I see what needs to be fixed, that's a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And it's interesting that two other passages in Matthew speak exactly into this because later on in the Sermon on the Mount, which the Beatitudes is part of, Jesus teaches us to pray, Lord, your kingdom come here on earth like it is in heaven. And, and later on, Matthew says, I think it's cha in chapter 11, he says, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And the rest falls into place. See, there's a, there's a woven into Matthew, this understanding that God's kingdom and God's righteousness, that that righteousness only happens when God brings it. But I'm hungry for it. And in Jesus' words, those who are hungry for the right things will be filled, will be satisfied. You know, it's, it's almost the sense of... Some of you remember the old Snickers commercials? Here, have a Snickers. Why? You're just not yourself when you're, when you're hungry. I guess I'm not supposed to put my foot there. Uh, you know, some character turns out to be somewhat, in the moment they have something. But you know, a Snickers only lasts so long. I, I love Snickers. Um, they only last so long. When you have a really good meal, man, that lasts. Jesus says when you're hungry and thirsty for righteousness, you will experience being full.
like nothing else can give you. So I just want to just finish with three thoughts on this to, to just kind of carry this. And again, keeping Cookie Monster in mind because Cookie Monster is a good example of, boy, I'm hungry for the wrong things all the time, but even Cookie Monster needed veggies because that was, was more healthy for him. So just kind of three thoughts. Um, the first is this. Have you ever been truly hungry? I don't mean that feeling that you're about to have in about 30 seconds when I say, you know, I'm thinking right now of a nice medium rare steak with a baked potato and, and you know, a little applesauce on the side and maybe a, a corn on the cob with that. It's a little early in corn season, but I see blueberries are in season now, so a bowl of blueberries over some ice cream, you know. And I can imagine that there is somebody sitting here right now and your stomach is going... Right? Okay, sorry. That's not hunger. That's your stomach saying it's getting close to noon, your alarm is about to go off, you need something to eat. Why? Because your body is accustomed to eating at 8 in the morning, approximately, noon, and 6. And your body is so used to that routine that if you change from that routine, your body knows it enough to go, <clears throat> don't forget me, feed me. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, have you gone a week without knowing where your next meals were? I did it again. There's something about that spot. Have you truly ever been hungry? The Bible's so aware of the fact that we can go for seasons of our life without ever experiencing hunger that one of the disciplines that's encouraged in Scripture is actually the discipline of fasting. Why? Because it's good for us physically, maybe. I don't know enough physiologically to say that fasting is good or not good, so I'm not going to advocate for it or against it from a physiological reason. But I'm, I'm going to suggest that there is a spiritual reason for it because how can we identify with this expression, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, if we've never experienced hunger? And the discipline of fasting, the message puts it this way, when you practice some appetite-denying discipline to better concentrate on God, don't make a production out of it. Don't, don't, you know, don't walk into a room going, I'm fasting and I'm miserable. You know, don't, don't make an issue out of it. But you see, fasting is done to take away something that is normally good that we've become dependent on in some way to fill an appetite that isn't healthy for us. So here's an interesting thought. Those of you that cannot put your phone down, try fasting from your phone for two solid days. Those of you that cannot put your devices down, put your device down for two solid days. I promise you that the moment you make that decision, that device is going to dominate your thoughts because you've wired yourself to need it. You've wired yourself to need that device. You've wired yourself to need texts. You've wired, because physiologically, we even know that's the case, that the moment you get that ding on your phone that someone has texted you, there is a chemical that gets released in your brain that is almost like a hit of, of a happy emotion. And you become so dependent on that dopamine hit in your brain from the ding of your phone that the moment you silence it or the moment you turn it off and the moment you set it aside, you become almost in withdrawal from the, the need to be filled by that. And I'm just saying that, that there is something to be said about depriving of ourselves voluntarily of things that are okay for us but have somehow crowded out our Ability to hear God. So that list I had earlier, success, recognition, acceptance, missing out, experiences, wealth, power, achievement, grades, happy relationships, safety. If some of those are really driving you, how might you develop a way to fast of those things? 
It's an appetite-denying discipline. So have you ever really been hungry? This beatitude means a whole lot more when we experience need and it's true need that we really on a gut level get. Second, in the same way, this beatitude warns against a junk food diet. You cannot live on chocolate chip cookies or peanut butter cookies or help me out. What's a favorite cookie favorite? Oh, come on. You're better than that. What's a good cookie favorite? Oreos. Oreos. Monster. Monster cookies. Okay. You can't live on cookies alone. In fact, I think someone pretty smart said you can't even live on bread alone. Jeremiah kind of reminds people, and then Isaiah, these are Old Testament prophets, and, and they spoke in, in ways that, that were relevant to their day, but, you know, a cistern is, a, is a, something that can hold water. And Jeremiah said, you know, God's people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the real living water, and they've dug their own wells or broken cisterns or things that held water, and they cannot hold water. There's a typo in there. It's not cannot hold water. It's hold water. Um, and why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Be very careful, and I think that that is one of the biggest dangers of living in a relatively comfortable middle-class setting, as most of us do, or at least many of us do, and that is, is that we, be comfortable, we have become so comfortable in this lifestyle and so comfortable in this setting that, that those those things around us and, and the stuff around us has actually become junk food for us. And it actually gets in the way of our relationship with God. There was a time in my life when I had admittedly way too many hobbies. Just because everything I kind of put my hand to, I enjoyed doing was just good enough at it to be able to do it, but just lousy enough at it to never be really good at it. Um, and there was a point in my 30s where I said, you know what, I've got to cut this back. There's not time in my day for even the important things for me to be able to dedicate to what's vital. I'm just, I'm busier and busier and busier with fun. So just be careful about, you know, like Cookie Monster, I mean, just be aware of the cookies in your life. Oh, man, that has so many different meanings, doesn't it? Um, just be aware of the junk food in, in your diet. Um, and I think if my life is only a, a pale reflection of the rest of us, is that there's probably more junk food than we'd be willing to admit. We really crave those things like success and recognition and acceptance and missing out and experiences and so on. We crave those things and we keep trying to set our table with them. So just be real careful about the junk food diet. Last, this beatitude guides our deepest desires and our deepest appetites. Psalm 42 some of you know this as, a, as an old song that the church used to sing about 20 years ago. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. There is a deep thirst that can only be filled by God himself in his righteousness and his kingdom. Listen, listen to me, says Isaiah, and eat what is good. Your soul will delight in the richest of fare. You know, one of the things that we notice when we're growing up is that the food that we sometimes hated as kids was really good for us. And we actually develop an appetite for those things. I remember talking to somebody who had had a heart attack once, who had, had his doctor had said to him, now these are the things that you can no longer eat. You can't have ice cream anymore. You can't have butter anymore. You can't have bacon anymore. You can't have eggs anymore. You can't have anything with cholesterol anymore. And of course the joke was, you mean I can't have anything with taste anymore? It's like, yeah, you, you know, you can't eat red meat anymore. And, and, you know, of course, some of that diet stuff has changed. 
But I noticed in talking with him that he said that some of those things, there were foods that were bad for him that after five years of disciplining himself in a healthy diet, he says, I've just lost my appetite for ice cream. He said, it just doesn't sound good anymore. You see, this beatitude shapes our diet, our spiritual diet to say, listen, I'm going to avoid the things that aren't good for me anymore, and I'm going to start eating spiritually, and I'm going to focus my diet, my menu is going to be much more the things that will fill me. And, and you know, church and fellowship and family and friends, they are all wonderful things, but they do not substitute for a relationship with the living God. They just don't. And sometimes they can get in the way of it. This beatitude guides what we're most deeply, most deeply hungry for. And let me ask this even about Evergreen as, a, as, a, as an organization, as a group of people that, that has gone through seasons of incredible visible success and let's face it, the last several months have been an expression of, let's call it, less visible success. What are we hungry for? Are we hungry for the look of a full auditorium? Are we hungry for the look of a big church? Are we hungry for the look of a proficient band? Are we hungry for the look and the sound of what looks like success? Or are we hungry for a church that is driven by and pointed toward a deeper and growing relationship with Jesus Christ because he alone is our living hope? What are we hungry for? I'm not going to answer that question for you. But it's a really important question to ask. Because there's a lot of church fluff out there also. There's a lot of empty church calories out there also. But nothing substitutes a healthy, deep relationship with Jesus Christ. So what are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? If at the end of the day you say, C is for cookie, that's good enough for me, okay. I can't change your appetite, but my role as a pastor is simply to hold up this ideal of scripture and to say, listen, there, there are good menu choices and there are bad menu choices. What have you developed an appetite for? What are you hungry for? In just a moment, we're going to sing the song, Lord, I Need You. And that really pulls together these thoughts that says, listen, you know, I, I, I may want stuff, but at the end of the day, I am hungry for the Lord who loves me and who has pulled my life into such a direction that I can only end up with him. What are you really hungry for? Would you pray with me, please? Father, as we finish this time with your word, I pray that your word and your spirit will do its work. Um, I, I pray that my meager work has, has brought the word forward, but I also pray that in each of us there is a deeper sense of, of a healthy appetite and, a, and an appetite that can only be filled by you. Lord, we need you. Every hour we need you. You are our one defense. You are our righteousness. Oh, Lord, how we need you. In Jesus we pray. Amen.